So welcome back, everyone. Um, and uh, this, this session is the breakout session on follicular and other indolent lymphomas. And during this session, we'll review the disease-specific biology of follicular lymphoma and other indolent lymphomas, uh, examine current Canadian treatment options available, and highlight some treatments coming to Canada uh, under research um, within clinical trials. So, so leading our presentation today is Dr. Carolyn Owen, who's a colleague of mine in Calgary. Uh, so at the University of Calgary, she's Associate Professor in the Division of Hematology and Hematologic Malignancies. Uh, she completed her internal medicine training in Toronto, hematology training in Vancouver, and a research fellowship at uh, St. Bart's uh, London School of Medicine in London in the UK. Um, her current clinical interests are related to low-grade indolent lymphomas, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and she's the principal investigator for numerous studies um, in evaluating novel agents for these diseases in Calgary. And so thank you, Carolyn, uh, for taking the time to present on this topic today. We look forward to your presentation. I will um, just begin. So this is the introductory slide. Let's see. Okay, I'm just making sure that I know how to change my um, uh, move forward. So, so as mentioned, uh, I was asked uh, really just broadly to speak about uh, indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma with a focus on follicular lymphoma. Not surprisingly, because follicular lymphoma is the most common of the indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma subtypes. And so I'm just going to discuss a bit about the diagnosis and staging and then prognostic testing um, and then a Canadian approach to the treatment. Um, there are a number of different agents that have been proven to have some efficacy in this disease, but in Canada, we really only use those that have good quality evidence and that are funded. So uh, although it might be interesting to hear about a bunch of other agents, if they're not relevant to you or to your family members, I thought that probably people weren't that interested in hearing about them. So um, American guidelines or or uh, presentations may have a larger number of drugs discussed because they have uh, a different funding mechanism, let's say. Um, so, so this is a, a, a little schema table that I created for a lecture that I do for the medical students at the University of Calgary. Um, after the first few years that I did uh, uh, medical school um, uh, lectures on CLL, I had a, a a lot of people asking me the difference between leukemia and lymphoma coming back and forth. Um, even for my patients who have chronic lymphocytic leukemia, I often sort of accidentally say, you know, because of your lymphoma, because in my mind, CLL falls under the same category as lymphoma. So I created this just to kind of give people a bit of a big picture. This does not include every subtype of lymphoma, but you can see that there's non-Hodgkin and Hodgkin, and then under non-Hodgkin, most non-Hodgkin lymphomas that we see are B-cell derived. And of those, you can either be aggressive or indolent. And of the indolent, that just means it's chronic and slow growing. And under indolent, the most common diagnosis is follicular lymphoma. But there are a lot of other subtypes, marginal zones, small lymphocytic, lymphoplasmacytic, uh, hairy cell leukemias, technically lymphoma. So just to give you an idea that this is a very, very broad category. So this is a, a table, um, an international uh, data registry um, information about the uh, frequency of different non-Hodgkin lymphoma, um, indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma subtypes. And so um, uh, uh, follicular lymphoma is, is by far the most common. And then there's a, a number of different kinds of marginal zone lymphoma, um, of which there's malt, nodal, um, and splenic marginal zone. And then uh, small lymphocytic lymphoma is really a, a sort of sister disease to chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is actually quite a bit more common and um, is uh, considered as a sort of different disease um, from indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma in most of these sort of talks. Mantle cell lymphoma is included here, but for many people with mantle cell lymphoma, it acts quite aggressive. And so we often don't really lump it in to the indolence, but some of them act very indolent and can be treated like an indolent lymphoma. Um, 
So, so this is uh, actually local data, just to give you an idea, um, the rate for follicular lymphoma in the last slide was reported at 22% and ours was 17 and percent. So that's really not too dissimilar. Um, uh, the, the rates of uh, follicular lymphoma are, are less than that of the most common aggressive lymphoma, which is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, but it's still the second most common lymphoma that we see in Calgary. Uh, so, so what is follicular lymphoma? Why is it called that? Uh, the follicle is a, a, a normal part of a normal um, lymph node. Is The follicle is the area where all of these cells that are being exposed to antigens, uh, the B cells, as they mature and try to make antibodies and help protect us and develop our immune system, they cluster into these little sort of um, uh, nodules within the lymph node, and that's called a follicle. And so with follicular lymphoma, you maintain the appearance of these sort of nodules. Um, and uh, that's different from other lymphomas that can be more generalized in the way that the malignant cells appear. So uh, there's a number of different ways that the pathologists uh, confirm that that's really what this is. Most patients with follicular lymphoma have this very distinctive translocation between um, the genes on 14 and 18. Um, and, uh, and, and that leads to overexpression of this BCL2 protein. And that's also something that can be stained because then you see it's very dark. So, so the diagnosis of follicular lymphoma um, requires obviously a, a sample of tissue. Um, and uh, once they have the diagnosis of the follicular lymphoma, they, they will tend to grade it into different grades. It's always uh, complicated to remember the difference between grading and staging, but grading relates really to the appearance of the cells on the slide and how uh, aggressive appearing they, they look. In the old days, they had uh, four different grades, grade one, grade two, grade three A and three B. Um, but nowadays our pathologists and most pathologists will lump grades one and two together mostly because when they did um, investigations for looking at the same sample in different labs, it wasn't very reliable what one person would call one, another person might call two. And so it didn't really seem to matter for outcome. So rather than fixating on whether there's zero to 15 larger looking cells or three to, or, or, or more than 15, um, they, then they, they just call it grade one to two. And that's the most common subtype of follicular lymphoma. Grade 3A can have um, larger areas of uh, 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 larger cells, but they're still not um, looking like a true aggressive lymphoma, whereas grade 3B follicular lymphoma is actually treated and considered to be an aggressive lymphoma and isn't really relevant to this talk. So like most indolent non-Hodgkin lymphomas, the name indolent means non-aggressive. We also talk, call these chronic lymphomas. And so they tend to occur and not change quickly and often have been there for a long time before they're found. So some people can be completely asymptomatic and this isn't uh, uh, that rare. We'll see people who are um, diagnosed because maybe they had a urinary tract infection and somebody said, could you have a kidney stone? They have a scan and they don't do or don't have a kidney stone, but they have some enlarged lymph nodes. And then that leads to investigations. And they never knew they had the enlarged lymph nodes and they may have had them for a long time. Similarly, people might come to their family doctor and the family doctor says, I feel a lump in your neck or your armpit or your groin if they do a physical exam. And the person themselves wasn't aware of it at all and doesn't know how long it's been there. So some people are just completely asymptomatic and don't notice these nodes at all. If you do notice a lymph node, usually it's painless. It, it enlarges, but it doesn't, it's not tender. So if you press at it, it doesn't hurt more. Um, and they can kind of wax and wane. Your own immune system can control this disease a bit. So some people will say that they really noticed something, a lump came up, but then even by the time they went back to the doctor, they noticed it had settled back down on its own. You can have very large um, masses still without any kind of symptoms. And then you can have involvement of other um, hematopoietic uh, organs. So the spleen can enlarge, the liver can enlarge, and cells from this disease can be present in the bone marrow. Um, you can of often have quite a few of the cells in the bone marrow without it causing any harm to the bone marrow uh, production. So sometimes you can have these cells in the bone marrow, again, with the blood counts being completely normal and you would never know they were there if you hadn't looked. 
it's uncommon for slow growing diseases to affect non um, lymph node, a spleen or bone marrow, so non heme organs. Um, and uh, uh, one of the classic sort of lymphoma symptoms that a lot of people hear about and, and, and are the, the B symptoms, weight loss, drenching, night sweats, and fevers. And these are actually uncommon for slow growing diseases. Uh, they're not that common for aggressive diseases, but far more common in aggressive diseases. Uh, so if you have a diagnosis of follicular lymphoma or indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma, or that's what we think is happening, then we need to figure out where it is. And that's how we determine the stage. And most of staging for this disease is done with CT scans. And so you can scan the neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Um, there's a newer scanned type called a PET scan, um, which is a, a, a radio isotope used to kind of light up in areas where there's uh, lymphoma cells, in addition to taking the pictures, which a CT does, because the two things are done sort of together. Um, follicular lymphoma does light up bright on uh, PET scans, so the PET scan is even more sensitive. You might catch more areas of disease with a PET scan than you would with a CT. We, we don't always need to do a PET scan for follicular lymphoma because if a CT shows that there's lots of disease in different places, then it, it, it likely doesn't have a big impact. But if by chance it looked like there was only a lymph node in one spot and we thought it was truly limited stage, then the PET scan is more sensitive. So we do the PET scan to make sure it looks like it truly is only in that one spot. Um, then we tend to do some basic blood work. And the bone marrow is actually a necessary part of the staging because the disease isn't very aggressive. So the PET scan is very good at picking up sites of disease, but if there's a low level of disease in the bone marrow, the PET scan won't see that. And your blood counts can be completely normal while still having some lymphoma in the bone marrow. Often we don't do the bone marrow test just because it's not very comfortable um, and patients aren't keen to have it done just really for staging purposes if it's not going to make a change to what we do. Um, but if we were being um, proper in our staging and doing it um, as required to get the full stage for every patient, then we would be doing a bone marrow every time somebody was diagnosed with this disease. So stage one is a single lymph node site. Stage two is more than one lymph node site on the same side of the diaphragm. Stage three is both above and below the diaphragm. And then stage four means that the lymph lymphoma is in a, a non-lymph node organ, which with follicular lymphoma is commonly the bone marrow. This is a schematic of where lymph nodes exist within your body so that um, uh, this, this comes from an article where um, the, this group determined a prognostic score for follicular lymphoma, and so we'll talk about that next. But how many lymph node sites you have that are involved by lymphoma is one of the predictors for uh, survival and for need for treatment, and uh, how they classify how many lymph node sites you have is um, uh, determined by uh, this sort of schematic. So if you have cervical lymph nodes, that means in the neck, they can be on the right or the left, and um, axillary lymph nodes is the armpits, mediastinum means in the center of the chest, mesenteric is um, upper abdominal, um, paraaortic is sort of back of the abdomen, and then inguinal um, is uh, way down at the groin. So the FLIPI score, as I mentioned, this prognostic score uses uh, how many lymph node sites you have, so number of nodal areas. Um, you can get up above four, which is one of the higher risk um, features for flicky lymphoma quite quickly. If you have lymph nodes on both sides of the neck, for example, and both armpits, you're already at four and you might not have a lot of big lymph nodes. Um, but uh, some of the other factors, well, age is a risk factor, but that's true for every single disease because unfortunately, if you're very old, you're likely to not live as long as if you start off really young and um, that, it, that factor influences outcomes for pretty much all cancers. If you're advanced stage versus limited stage, if you have a low hemoglobin, meaning probably your bone marrow isn't working so well from this. And then if this, the LDH, which is one of the blood tests in the blood is elevated, then that um, is a risk factor as well. The more of those um, risk factors you have, the higher the score and the um, reduced, and that leads to a reduced expected survival. 
Um, this is a second score. So if you have one score, everybody likes to get publications. So then another group came up with a different score. The only reason I include this is to say that um, bone marrow involvement and then this beta-2 microglobulin are also factors that have been included as being slightly higher risk for um, not getting as long a remission to treatment. Uh, so the uh, treatment approach for indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma is um, uh, includes a watch and wait um, contemplation, and that, that is uh, um, for patients who have advanced stage disease, we don't necessary in necessarily initiate treatment right away unless you have some kind of symptoms. And that's a very strange idea for a lot of people, but um, there have been studies performed where patients were treated right away when they found out that they had this disease versus being watched until there was some sort of bother that happened that made them um, feel a need to have treatment. And in that study, they didn't show a uh, an improvement for treating right away. If you have very symptomatic disease, then obviously we want to give you treatment. And so we have um, recommendations that we'll talk about to come. Uh, the only treatment that we absolutely do for somebody who might not have any symptoms at all is if you have very limited stage disease, usually stage one uh, or maybe stage two, but kind of close together. Um, and we think it's only in that one area. So you will have had to have had a bone marrow to show no disease and a PET scan to confirm that it's only in one spot. Then there's a chance that maybe this disease can be cured by radiation at that, at that point in time. And because radiation has local side effects, but not generalized side effects, and obviously you'd want to do that right away to see if you can, um, if you can cure the disease at that stage. And um, uh, whereas with the chemotherapy, historically, we've always told people that with follicular lymphoma, that we're not curing them by giving them chemotherapy. We're just achieving a remission and hoping that remission is a very long remission. In our experience, actually, even though the textbooks say that you can't really cure this, many people have remissions well beyond 10 years in our, in our um, uh, population, some beyond 20 years, where we actually think that some people probably are cured by the treatment that we give them. Uh, but obviously, we need to follow people for a very long time to be absolutely certain. And the majority of people will see their disease come back at some point in the future. We just hope that it's a very long time from when they've had their first treatment. For those, oops, sorry, I've gone forward when I shouldn't have. For those who do have their disease come back, so they experience a relapse, um, there's a bunch of different treatment options and there isn't really one standard. If you're young and fit, then we do an autologous stem cell transplant. So high dose chemotherapy with your own blood stem cells to rescue the bone marrow. Um, in, in Calgary, that's a popular uh, treatment option. In some other places, they might just do more different chemotherapy treatments. Uh, so who needs treatment? When I said that if you don't have symptoms and you're not bothered by this, then you know, we don't give any treatment. So how do we know when you do need treatment? Um, there's a number of different uh, um, clinical trial groups that have created uh, treatment requirement categories. Um, the reason for these categories is because it, in a clinical trial, let's say somebody suddenly develops a new treatment, they think it looks amazing, we all think, oh, this looks great, maybe it works wonderful. Um, if we know that we think it works wonderful, the motivation might be to offer treatment to people where otherwise you would have just been leaving them alone and watching them as we would do currently. And so maybe this, if you give this wonderful new treatment, it's going to look amazing. But in all honesty, you're actually treating people that you would never have treated previously who might have done well with nothing. So the clinical trials have this requirement that you have some kind of problem so that they can be sure that they, when they publish uh, an improvement with a new treatment, that they, that they can justify that they had patients in the study who would have been treated otherwise. And so you can have some of these features at times and maybe not need treatment, but you need to have at least something of this nature to, to, to justify having treatment. And the GELF criteria, which is the Group de Tube de Lymphome Follicular, this is the French uh, follicular lymphoma group, is probably the most common of the used uh, criteria. And so if you have one lump that's more than seven centimeters, at least three sites that are more than three centimeters, if you're feeling poorly in terms of systemic symptoms, those classic B symptoms of weight loss, night sweats, or fevers, if you have a, a big spleen that's bothersome, usually not just enlarged on scan, um, or if you have any kind of organ compromise, so rarely people can get things like 
um, effusions, meaning fluid in the uh, space around the lungs or in the abdomen, um, related to the lymphoma. Um, uh, if you have a big lump in the pelvis, but it just happens to be in the wrong place and it's squeezing off the uh, ureter and the kidney looks like it's swelling up from that, then these are reasons that, um, that people would uh, initiate treatment even if somebody felt pretty well. And similarly, if your blood counts are quite low, um, those, that would be a clear indication for treatment. So, so why do we feel okay about uh, using this so-called watch and wait approach? Um, a lot of people don't like the term watch and wait. We're supposed to try to use now the, the, the term active observation because the whole point is we're not just leaving you alone, sending you away, saying, oh, this is just follicular lymphoma, we're not doing anything. It's actually just um, deferring therapy until there's a need. Um, and in this study that uh, the data comes from, you can see it's published in 2003, which means it began enrolling in the 1990s. And I think uh, I can confidently state that our treatments for follicular lymphoma and other indolent non-Hodgkin lymphomas have advanced significantly since the time this study was performed. So this is a very good study, but it is um, only so relevant because of the comparator arm. So the treatment patients received a drug called chlorambucil as it's on its own. And that is a traditional uh, chemotherapy agent, but all on its own without rituximab. Uh, what's amazing about the study is that they lost almost no patients to follow up. So they knew the outcomes for everybody and they followed the people for years. And so the, um, uh, the two curves you can see show that it doesn't matter whether the patients were being observed or they were being treated right away, that their survival rates were exactly the same. And then in the group of um, the outcomes, the, the patients who actually died, the reasons for, um, for uh, deaths were, um, the, the, there was no more deaths in the treatment arm, in the sorry, observation arm for lymphoma, but there was a, um, uh, a couple uh, second cancers also in both arms. So, um, the time in the median time to requiring treatment, meeting any kind of symptom need was just under three years. So it gives you an idea that if you're waiting and being watched, that the sort of three year expectation, now that still means that that's a median, half of people went longer than that and half of people needed treatment sooner. But it gives you an idea that you're not just talking about waiting a few weeks, you're ideally looking to wait several years. So what I think is also the most important about this study where, like I said, they followed people for such a long time and they really kept an eye on them and didn't lose anybody, is that at uh, 10 years, 20% of the patients in the group that didn't have treatment right away still had not had any kind of treatment. So there's patients who will develop even a spontaneous remission from follicular lymphoma where they do follow up imaging after and it looks like you've had some treatment but you haven't just because your own immune system has managed to fight it off. Um, there's several other studies that show similar data. Um, one from uh, an American group at uh, looking at a more of a single center uh, study. And then um, uh, this is an uh, Italian group. And, and they all show uh, very similar things. Three to four years on average before patients require therapy with a number of patients never actually requiring therapy in the time that the follow-up is done. So, um, the question is if this is not so relevant to today because we don't treat with chlorambucil all on its own, maybe we could do better today by giving people treatment sooner. And part of one of the, the, one of the major advancements in treatment for any non-Hodgkin lymphoma is this antibody drug called uh, rituximab, which is an antibody against CD20, an antigen or a protein on the outside of the lymphoma cells. Um, so the rituximab being just an antibody and not a traditional chemo is actually very well tolerated. And in the, in the US, they, they treat a lot of patients just with rituximab because it's very well tolerated. People are quite willing to receive a drug that's an antibody and it's not a chemo. The problem is if you give rituximab all on its own, it can work okay, but it doesn't work nearly as well as getting it with chemo and it doesn't last as long. So then you have to kind of get treated again sooner. But if you have no symptoms and we would have given you nothing, then maybe getting just the rituximab might be a good approach. And that was the whole principle of this sort of follow-up study to the watch and wait, where the patients were actually offered rituximab versus watch and wait. And it was randomized, so you didn't get to choose what you got. Um, and based on this, uh, the, the primary um, outcome of the study was time to initiation of new therapy, which, I mean, is... is 
the, the rituximab was a treatment, right? So the people in the rituximab group got to be followed until they next needed chemo. And the people who were getting nothing were followed until they next needed chemo. So to say that giving something made you go longer before you needed chemo wasn't really all that exciting. I think what is more exciting were the secondary endpoints of survival. So do you make people live longer by getting rituximab right away at the beginning? And um, it's going to take years and years before they may show that. And at this point, they definitely haven't. And so in, in, in Alberta, we still tend to offer people this watchful waiting approach and when they need treatment we treat them properly with rituximab and a chemo together um, in british columbia they have adapted adopted this rituximab monotherapy for asymptomatic people and they give a few doses and then leave you alone and so uh, depending on where you are in the country the the approach to this study and what we did with it um, uh, might be different this is uh, the, the results as they were presented from the study, where you can see that the, the green and the red arms in the, uh, in the survival curves are the uh, rituximab groups. So one group just got four doses of rituximab, another group was getting kind of regular ongoing rituximab. And so the regular ongoing is the red line, they're doing the best, but they're not doing that much better than the ones who only got a few doses. Um, but this is time to starting next treatment, as I mentioned. So it's not, not as interesting as the overall survival curves, which if you look at the overall survival curves, it doesn't look like there's any reason to want to be on one curve over another. So it looks like the rituximab, at least at this point in time, hasn't changed how people are going to, how long people are going to live in general. So, so as I mentioned, there's um, really good follow-up from these watch and wait studies. And, and I, I think this is the, the reason I'm putting so much um, from I think the watch and wait or active observation discussion and, and decision for patients is a very difficult one. A lot of people just feel like they came in, we gave you the worst news of your life, you've been told you have cancer, but now we're telling you we're going to do nothing about it. Um, some people celebrate, they say, oh good, I didn't want to have anything done, but a lot of people just feel a sense of abandonment. They feel like they're not being, they're not being cared for properly. They feel like uh, the importance of the disease is being under um, estimated and then they leave and they keep feeling worried and anxious. And so it is, it is necessary to recognize that there's good quality data for this approach, but that if it's making you feel terrible all the time, we often will treat people who just can't feel comfortable with the idea of watching. Uh, I, I haven't shown slides from our own data, but we do have some data that suggests that uh, maybe for a time we weren't doing as good a job as we could have been doing and how we were watching people. And so we're really trying to be careful now that even if you feel great, we are recommending that people have some scans so that you, you have the confidence to know that things aren't changing in a way that we're not aware of um, that we should have done something about. So those who are on this watch and wait protocol should have an idea of when their next scan is. And it shouldn't just be a maybe never, it should be a planned um, uh, decision so that we don't miss things as uh, something might be growing that you're not aware of. So uh, the single agent rituximab discussion instead is something that is only funded in certain provinces. And um, based on the data, I, I don't think that you're missing out if you haven't been offered single agent uh, rituximab. This is a study um, representation is one of the first studies to prove the importance of the rituximab added to chemo. So CVP is a chemo combination that we used to be very popular that we gave to most people until about seven, eight years ago. Um, and this was one of the, the first studies. This is an uh, um, event free for overall survival. So this is how long the, each time the curve drops off, it's a patient who has died on the study. And so you can clearly see that by getting the rituximab, more people were living still um, beyond five years, which is obviously the, the goal is to make people live as long as possible with this disease. This is a similar um, study, but it was using uh, CHOP, which is CVP plus an extra drug, but the extra drug has, it, uh, adds quite a bit of um, toxicity and intensity to the regimen. But you can see that with that, they are, the curves look even more um, uh, splayed in terms of benefit from receiving the rituximab. Uh, this study is uh, called the STILL study. It's, um, that's the name of the uh, German um, low-grade lymphoma uh, study group. And this is a study that is most relevant to patients today in uh, Canada because this represents the 
um, uh, treatment that we most commonly use. And this is a combination of a drug called bendamustine with rituximab again. And it was compared against our CHOP, which was the standard kind of at the time. And it included all of the low grade lymphoma subtypes, even including mantle cell. Um, and uh, you can see from the curves here again, the yellow line is the BR compared to the RCHOP and the yellow line, the patients are doing significantly better. Um, at the time the study was reported, the median um, duration of response was still not even reached. So um, uh, with time, I think this came out sort of around a seven year average. And in this study, they did not use rituximab maintenance um, which adds to remissions even further. So it gives you an idea of how long we're hoping that people remain in remission after um, their first time treatment. This is another um, study that I think is kind of relevant to uh, current discussions around what to do about follicular lymphoma because it includes the drug Revlimid or lenalidomide. So lenalidomide is the generic name. It's the one we're supposed to use, but they call this regimen R squared. That's, and the reason for that is because the trade name for the drug has an R. Um, this is a second generation from uh, a, a thalidomide uh, uh, derivative. Um, so it is a little bit awkward for patients to take, even though most people who are on active chemotherapy aren't thinking about having children. We know that thalidomide isn't, uh, is, um, uh, uh, causes teratogenic effects. And so, um, so people who take lenalidomide have to get a whole bunch of education and promise that they'll never uh, share the drug with women who could get pregnant and other sort of silly kind of questions, but it's all for safety reasons. Um, but the, but the, the, the goal of this therapy is that lenalidomide is not actually a traditional chemotherapy. So traditional chemotherapy drug in the cycle or um, while it's trying to turn over, um, uh, it, they're not very specific. They kill any cell that's turning over quickly. That's why some of them can make you lose your hair or cause um, maybe mouth sores or that sort of thing because um, the chemo doesn't just affect the cell it's trying to kill. Whereas the lenalidomide is a little more specific to um, the, the blood cell and the blood cell cancer. So um, it was hoped that this would be a better treatment than chemotherapy. And we did participate in this study in many places across Canada because um, it was a uh, 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 first time treatment for uh, follicular lymphoma study. Um, but, the, but in the end, the, the results just prove that the treatment is not any worse than, our, than rituximab with chemo, which for us is usually this BR, but they still had a lot of problems with side effects and it's uh, quite a bit more expensive than standard chemo. And the regimen itself was a lot longer than the six month of standard chemo followed by rituximab maintenance. And so, uh, although this is quite a popular regimen and, the, and, and uh, lenalidomide comes up a lot in American type talks, uh, it isn't actually used very commonly at all in Canada. The PRIMA study here is a study that sh that defined that um, uh, sorry justified the use of rituximab maintenance after chemo. So as I mentioned, the BR that we use, the study that we use to justify BR, where BR one compared to our CHOP, they just gave six months of bendamustine rituximab and then they were done, and the patients can have a long remission after that. In this study, uh, they gave patients chemo with rituximab and it, there's a couple different options. And then one group of patients were just left alone after the six months of chemo are, and the other group received some rituximab alone in follow-up for the next couple years. In the study, they got it every two months in our standard practice, we give it every three months. There's never been a really good head to head. You can see from the red curve where the patients were getting the rituximab and follow-up that they have a longer time till their disease progresses. They have a longer time till they need a next lymphoma therapy. They have a not another next, a longer time before they need any other kind of chemo, um, but they don't have a difference in overall survival. So what that means is um, you can have your remission duration be extended and go for a longer time before you have to worry about lymphoma or worry about being treated again. But probably the people who get treated a second time who never had maintenance We'll have a little bit of a longer remission the second time and everybody will catch up again at the end. Still, we think that uh, having a really long first remission is probably the best thing for people because once you get into remission, your life should hopefully and ideally does go back to normal. You don't have a disease anymore. You're not on any active therapy after the maintenance is finished and you get to be a normal person. 
as soon as you experience a recurrence and you have to reinitiate therapy, there's a whole bunch of quality of life reduction issues there, which I think um, uh, we would prefer to, to, to defer as far away as possible. So in Canada, in most centers, we recommend rituximab maintenance for all patients. But if somebody's really old, or right now we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, if you didn't feel comfortable with the maintenance, then it would be acceptable to not want to have it because of the fact that the overall survival isn't different. And this is just the even longer follow-up um, from that study where even with extra time, we're not seeing that the rituximab is making people live longer. It's just making people remain in remission um, and feel better for longer. This is a, a quick slide to show you what the toxicity of getting the rituximab maintenance is. Just again, we're talking about pandemic, we're talking about worries. You know, is this a really toxic treatment that you have to suffer for two extra years just to get uh, three, four extra years later? And the answer is no. So there's very few patients who actually had to discontinue treatment with rituximab maintenance because it was causing problems. And um, the really big things we would worry about, neutropenia means a low white blood cell count, with, where that's your um, first responder to infection. And then obviously infections, these, these did not occur commonly. And so a rituximab maintenance is a safe option. Another uh, change that uh, uh, I don't have the good curves to justify though, is that after we'd had rituximab for many years, the company worked hard to sort of change the formulation and turn it into this sort of thicker, more condensed um, product that could be provided as a subcutaneous injection. And that means an injection into the fat under the skin, kind of like an insulin shot, although there's a larger quantity, so it isn't just a quick poke, it's a little bit of a slow poke, um, instead of it being given intravenously into the vein. Now, if it's given intravenously, you can have some reactions while it's being given, but also it has to be given slowly. They can't just zap it in. And so the, the, the slowest infusion time for rituximab uh, in most centers across Canada was 90 minutes, so an hour and a half. So by the time you get in, you sit in the chair, you have to take some pre-medications, which ideally you've done um, and taken as pills before, but in some, we used to give some of those IV as well. So it could be a few hours use of um, just to get a rituximab maintenance versus now with the subcutaneous option, you can imagine how much less nursing time there is, how much more availability of chairs in the treatment area for other patients to come and get treatments, how much more convenient it is for you if you come in and get a quick shot and get out again. Um, also, less parking costs and time off work. And so um, the, uh, the, the use of these uh, of subcutaneous rituximab has come in across the board in most centers in Canada, certainly in, um, in Alberta. And so you typically only get an intravenous rituximab for your first dose, and then you get subcutaneous rituximab for all subsequent doses. Now that there are biosimilar versions of rituximab that are on the market um, that cost a lot less than the original IV rituximab, then some of the nursing savings are probably, you know, um, balanced out by the drug, uh, the biosimilar new IV rituximab being less expensive. And so there may be a move in the other direction in some places to come. So what if your disease was in remission, but then it comes back? That means you've relapsed. Um, at that point, it's kind of dealer's choice. It really depends on um, who you are and what the, how the disease had acted. And so for people who are really, really elderly now, they're obviously, they don't have as, um, they can't tolerate as aggressive of treatments or maybe if it comes back only in one spot and it's not that bothersome versus if it comes back in um, more generalized fashion, it makes you feel sick. Um, I mentioned before that we believe that high dose therapy with a stem cell transplant is a very effective therapy for relapsed um, uh, follicular lymphoma or low-grade lymphoma. Um, that's our standard practice for anybody who's young enough to get it, but some people will just get chemo, some people might get radiation, um, you might just leave it alone for a bit and watch again like you did the first time. So um, there's far more um, variability in the approach to relapse disease, and a lot of it depends on other medical problems the person might have, as I mentioned, their age, what their goals are, how aggressive they wanna be in the approach, how long they, they need or want for the next remission. 
Um, what's very important is if you have a relapse that's very early, that's only about 20% uh, of patients, but those patients really don't do as well. And so those people do need aggressive type treatments or clinical trials and um, everybody else hopefully can still do well. Um, there's a new antibody to replace rituximab with chemo for people where, where, where they relapsed very soon after the rituximab or while on rituximab maintenance, and that's called obinutuzumab, and so some people will get that drug. The study used obinutuzumab with bendamustine as the comparator, but that was because when the study was done, most people had not had bendamustine as their first treatment. So in um, Canada, most people, if they get this obinutuzumab for relapsed uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, they'll get it um, with, a, with a probably CVP or CHOP or a different chemo combination. This is a very difficult slide to take it, to, but I'm just showing you this one is the most important, the top left curve. This is what we call a waterfall plot where each of the individual little bars represents uh, an individual patient's response to a drug. And this 50 means 50% 50 smaller. So obviously coming lower means that your, sh your lumps are shrinking. Um, and this is the study that uh, uh, led to the availability of this drug called idelalisib, which is really mostly only used for people who have very um, resistant disease that, that doesn't respond to normal chemo or to rituximab anymore. Uh, this is just a quick representation of our results for patients who receive a stem cell transplant at relapse. Mostly that some of that is selection because the patients have to be well enough to get that stem cell transplant, young enough to get it. But um, uh, for any patient who is eligible for stem cell transplant, the outcomes are excellent and they go for a very long time with probably cure for a high proportion of patients who get a stem cell transplant at relapse. So I've most molecular lymphoma, but I was supposed to also mention other influence. A number of different infections that can be associated. So sometimes if you have a marginal zone lymphoma, you might get um, some infection testing. I mentioned, sorry, the, the bendamustine data, that's it, that was for all of the different non-Hodgkin lymphoma subtypes, so it's our standard for all of them. There's a special drug called ibrutinib, which is an oral drug used for other kinds of blood cancers like CLL that works really well for one specific subtype called Waldenstrom's. And so this is a picture of how well the patients who got ibrutinib and rituximab for Waldenstrom's did. Um, hairy cell leukemia is a very uncommon disease, but somebody was asking about it recently. And so I put in this little slide because these people get treated with a drug called cladribine, which is different yet again. Um, but this disease is associated with very, very long remissions and hopefully um, uh, not needing retreatment for a very long time. So I think I have come down to, I was supposed to give you 10 minutes for questions and I've only got five, so I apologize. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. That was great. Yeah, I think we've got a couple minutes for questions. Um, then we have to move to the other se session at 1.30. So um, let me just uh, pick out a few, because some of the questions came through as you were talking, and then you answered them as you kept talking, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> um, so maybe straightforward. Uh, are, what are the side effects of rituximab? So, um, so rituximab, I mentioned, can be given either subcutaneously or intravenous, but everybody has to get it at least intra intravenous at least once. And it causes infusion-related reactions in a large proportion of patients, but probably about 30% of patients with follicular lymphoma. And infusion can be anything from flu-like illness, like um, uh, fevers, aches, uh, chills, to hives or allergic-type reactions, like chest tightness, flushing. Um, and so it's given very slowly because mostly the, the reaction is just while it's going into the vein and when you stop it, then all those things settle back down. Okay. Um, <clears throat> why would you not be eligible for a stem cell transplant? Uh, so stem cell transplant, when we're talking about an auto transplant, which is most of what's relevant to this disease, is um, just really big doses of chemotherapy. And then the stem cells are used to sort of rebuild your blood system after the chemo could damage the normal blood cells. Um, so you have to be eligible to get a really big dose of chemo, meaning you can't, you can't have significant organ problems. If your heart doesn't work well or your kidneys don't work well, then, then that big dose of chemo could cause you more harm than benefit. So it's, it's not, we don't have an abrupt age cutoff. We used to say 
First it was 65, then it was 70. Now I believe it was somewhere near 75 recently. But, but anybody over, over 70 um, would have to sort of be questioning whether their body is strong enough to take that level of chemo. Okay, and just to follow up, um, so if you previously had cancer and the example given was 12 years ago, does that mean you were, can't have a stem cell transplant? Nope, I mean- Breast um, cancer or it, something. It, it, <clears throat> Yeah, so if it's a different cancer, obviously the hope is that that other cancer is cured. We don't have like organ transplants, some sort of rules, because I mean, it's not like it, your own blood stem cells, it's not like you're on a list where they, they're choosing who's most needy. If you are strong enough and fit enough and well enough to receive it, then it would be considered irrespective of your own past. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. I think you've addressed most of the other questions uh, as well. So probably for the sake of time, because the next session does start right at 1.30, we should close this session. And thank you, Carolyn, very much. That's very informative.